Our next actually presentation of Bengal Physician Journal by our editor, Dr. Anup Bhattacharya, he is absent. That's why uh, now it is our last session, a session on obesity and lipid. May I call upon the chairpersons, Dr. Amal Kumar Banaji, Dr. Sibabrata Banaji, and Dr. Rana Bhattacharya. Please come over the dais and to start the session. Good evening, my friends. Now we are going to start the session, Obesity and Lipid. First, I invite Professor Shomitra Ghosh. He is the Professor of Medicine and HOD in the Department of Medicine, IPGMR SSKM Hospital, Kolkata. He would talk on Obesity and Lipid. Shomitra, please. Good evening, everybody, respected chairpersons, all the delegates, my teachers, seniors, colleagues and junior friends. It's really a privilege and opportunity to, in front of me just to talk in front of this August gathering on this most important aspect of this current clinical practice. Because we are just having an erupted volcano of obesity, dyslipidemia, diabetes and hypertension and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in recent times to such an extent that there has been a recent global concern and it is from 2008, it is written in this hard textbook of heart that worldwide rise in the prevalence of obesity is threatening to undo the recent advances in the prevention and management of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Because we are getting plenty of cases of atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases, it is supported by this obesity, dyslipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, this fatty liver, PCOS, CKD and leading to strokes. We all know that the obesity is the epicenter of non-communicable diseases and atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases and this lipidemia is a major contributor to this atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in obesity. Because we all know that obesity is a disruption of this homeostasis, either there is disruption of this adipose tissue function, liver, muscle function, hypothalamus, gut microbiota and gut dysfunction. So when there is an excess lipid that first goes to this subcutaneous adipose tissue, then to this visceral adipose tissue, then to the organs, and then it becomes a circulating lipid. So when you get this lipidemia and obesity, it is actually the tip of the iceberg. It means there is adipose tissue is full of stored, liver is full, muscles are all full, and there is inflammation of all these organs. So there is the storage system of adipose tissue is not functioning well. These uptake organ muscles are not functioning well and liver is overwhelming with these lipids production. So it is insulin resistance. It is the final common pathway to any kind of lipid abnormality in obesity because insulin is a key hormone in regulation of lipid metabolism. We all know there are two lipids and it is all taken care of by insulin. It is the free fatty acid and glucose. And we all know that this insulin I mean, uh, I mean, controls this metabolic flexibility with the help of this FOXO protein. And this FOXO protein changes the switch between the fed state and the fasting state. They regulate this gluconeogenesis, lipogenesis, and this hepatic glucose production in the fed state and the fasting state is controlled completely by this FOXO protein. In insulin resistance, this FOXO is not inhibited, resulting into hepatic glucose production. And this hyperinsulinemia, for the time being, they take care of this hepatic glucose production. And to prevent this excess hepatic glucose production, they just switch over to this increased lipogenesis. So it is the other aspect of this glucose metabolism. Increased lipogenesis is the result just to decrease this hepatic glucose output. So in an attempt to suppress hepatic glucose output in this phase of insulin resistance, we pay the price by just increasing the lipogenesis. So whatever happens in insulin resistance, in the glycemic status, be it euglycemic, pre-diabetes or diabetes, there is dyslipidemia throughout this phase because dyslipidemia develops much before hyperglycemia in insulin resistance state. So what are the characteristic lipid abnormality in obesity? It is the atherogenic dyslipidemia and it is mostly characterized by fasting and postprandial hypertiglyceridemia. It is marked by increased VLDL, low HDL cholesterol and small and dense LDL particle. It may not be raised that much. And hypertiglyceridemia is the mother of all such abnormalities in such situation. We get a typical lipid profile report. TG is around 450. BLDL is around 76, HDL is just low 30, and LDL is marginally up or just around this normal level 108. So what is the overview of this lipid metabolism? We all know that these lipids are absorbed. They are not soluble in this water. So they are absorbed and this apoprotein coating is required. So these dietary fat are absorbed and coated with ApoB48. 
they are taken by this pancreatic lipase and they, these enterocytes take up and they are fastly taken by the lymphatics. They go through this thoracic duct and they come into the systemic circulation, not in the portal circulation, unlike this glucose and protein. And they actually come to these muscles and this adipose tissue for storage and utilization first, then it goes to the liver as chylomicron remnant. And when this lipid are not extract, extracted by this lipoprotein lipase, this liver gets profuse of these I mean, lipids reach with these chylomicrons, they give rise to increased production of BLDL, and these BLDL lipids are not adequately extracted by these muscles, as well as these lipids, and they go as the BLDL rich, I mean, with this, I mean, lipids, triglyceride, as remnants, they go into this further proceedings of IDL, LDL, etc., and they finally come back to this reverse cholesterol transport, all these LCAT and CETP, cholesterol esteral transfer protein, they take up these triglycerides from these cells, they give this cholesterol and these lipid molecules become less with this triglyceride by this effect of the CETP, they become small, they become dense with this cholesterol. And this is the result of, this is the I mean, mother of these atherosclerotic changes. So impaired lipolysis in these exogenous pathway as well as in the endogenous pathway is the marker of these kind of changes in obesity. So small dense LDL particle increase in obesity and that is easily permeable to this endothelium and that gives rise to all these fatty streak and atherosclerotic changes, atherogenic dyslipidemia is the result. But what causes this insulin resistance in obesity? It is a vicious cycle, cause and effect, genesis and propagation that goes on, adipose tissue changes, fatty liver, fatty muscles, gut microbiota, chronic inflammation and genetic and epigenetic changes. We all know that there are two I mean, kinds of lipid, I mean, fuels in our body, both are taken care of by insulin. This after feeding insulin by the action of this lipoprotein lipase, they push this inside the cells, all these kind of flu, I mean, I mean, free fatty acid, they are pushed up there inside the cell and they lock there inside by inhibiting hormone sensitive lipase. And with these meals, unless there was some fatty tissue, with this take of the 75 gram glucose, there could be eight fold rise in this glucose level and there could be 10 fold rise in the lipid level had there not been this adipose tissue. And that is the beauty of this adipose tissue trapped by this I mean, fatty leaf, I mean, uh, adipose tissue inside. When there is excess energy, either there is hypertrophy or hyperplasia, always hyperplasia or number of cells increase is desirable because small adipocytes can take up these lipids better, they are healthy, but these large adipocytes cannot take up further fatty, acid, fatty acids and they are unhealthy. They produce lot of cytokines, they are the source of inflammatory markers. All these cytokinesterol structures are shifted to one side and they are the marker of this insulin resistance. If this is the pro-inflammatory state and this becomes hypoxic and the inflammation goes on and on. So adipocyte hypertrophy, adipocyte hypoxia, altered gut microbiota, ectopic fat, they are the source and the gut microbiota is a potential factor because in obesity there is a shift from this, I mean gram positive or anaerobic to the gram negative side, metabolic endotoxinemia occurs and this outer coating of these gram negative organisms, they are the lipopolysaccharides and they are absorbed like lipids, they go to the organs first and that gives rise to widespread inflammation of all these organs and this inflamed tissue causes insulin resistance and there is a shift from the M1 to the M2 cells and this chronic inflammation is the forerunner of insulin resistance. The role of fatty liver and this fatty muscles, we all know this fatty liver result of excess and ectopic fat that is the source of obesity dyslipidemia, that is the increased lipid synthesis and secretion and increased gluconeogenesis is the factor. Atherogenic lipoprotein and glucose synthesis is the cause of this insulin resistance because liver is overflown with all these chylomicron remnants and the lipid particles. Similar thing happens with these fatty muscles. Skeletal muscles are the most insulin sensitive structure in the body. 85% energy is burned by that. They cannot use free fatty acid. And there is ectopic fat in the muscles, fatty muscles. And there is some, if there is low muscle mass adequately and there is inflammation with this thripty phenotype that give rise to this increased lipoprotein lipase which cannot take up this I mean, triglyceride further and hyperinsulinemia occurs, de novo lipogenesis occurs, oxidation reduces and all these intermediates are stored in the muscles and that is the cause of this post receptor defect and insulin resistance and that goes on as a vicious cycle. But why these people, some people do not develop all this lipidemia, that's the answer, so some people do not produce these signs of insulin resistance that much. So pathogenesis of lipid abnormality in obesity, these 
unholy loop of fatty acid trafficking in this, I mean, adipose tissue, liver, and these muscles goes on. Impaired peripheral fatty acid trapping, fatty acid fluxes from the adipocytes to the liver, overproduction of this VLDL, circulating PG hypolysis, and small, del, small dense LPL is the cause of this. So what are the health consequences? Atherogenesis is a highly atherogenic. See, is LDL cholesterol, small dense LDL particle, and this TG also are associated with atherosclerotic changes and neurocognitive, I mean, changes with this hyperthyroidemia, changes in the hippocampus. That is the result. So, what should be the management protocol? So, lifestyle intervention should be the first thing: dietary intervention and physical activity. Dietary interventions with 10% weight loss target should be the target. Cholesterol should be less than 200. Saturated fat, PUFA and MUFA should be up. Protein should be 200, I mean 20 gram percent, and with increased fiber. Physical activity should be one of the corners because physical activity increases insulin sensitivity in most of the ways. I mean lipoprotein lipase, hepatic lipase, hormone sensitive lipase, all becomes favorable, and TG becomes low because TG lipolysis becomes more. But lipid targets and pharmacological treatment, what should be the target? There should be two types of target. One is lipoprotein gold related. This is gold related LDL gold, this non HDL gold, TG gold, all are there. And intensity of this moderate incentive, intensity and the high intensity, they are basically supported by many guidelines. So statin should be the first choice. Do not fully correct characteristic dyslipidemia of obesity, but somehow they can take care of lower the TG marginally, not effective against I mean, small dense cholesterol. Fibrate may be added later. Nicotinic acid may be helpful. Apo B or non HDL targets are secondary to this LDL cholesterol. But despite reaching this target, current dyslipidemia management failed to completely prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular. That is the practical reality. And because we are treating the symptoms, not the cause. To summarize, dyslipidemia contributes significantly to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and obesity. Insulin resistance is the final common pathway to obesity dyslipidemia. And the core factors are adipose tissue inflammation, dysfunction, ectopic fat, gut microbiota, and epigenetic factors. Obesity is associated with dyslipidemia, which is highly atherogenic. And hyperthyroidemia is the hallmark with low HDL cholesterol and small dense LDL particle. Dietary and physical factors should be the major greatest role in this, I mean, management. Weight loss associated with decreased TG and and increase HDL cholesterol. Pharmacotherapy is beneficial, but inadequate to prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Current pharmacotherapy for dyslipidemia do not address the root cause and just targets the manifestation and modification of the core factors will improve the treatment outcomes in obesity dyslipidemia. More research is required, more understanding and more research related to this adipose tissue, ectopic fat, muscle mass, gut microbiota, and modulation of the epigenetic factors. We value our achievement so far, still we should not congratulate ourselves because with this, all these statin therapies, we have not been able to decrease this load of catherosclerotic cardiovascular disease because we have not done this right thing because we are treating this manifestation only. Root cause has not been taken care of. So miles to go before we rest. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh, for uh, I mean, concluding well within time. Thank you so much. But again, uh, as it's a long day and the time is uh, very scant, only running late. So, without any question, uh, so we have decided that okay. no question is allowed. Thanks. So, next, uh, uh, we'll call upon Dr. Durga, Durga P. Chakraborty for his next topic, that is the obesity paradox. Dr. Chakraborty, please. Thank you, Chairman, and our respected senior colleagues. I think this is the ideal session, obviously, because of this point, we see that at least 50% of the listeners are moderately obese. So I think the moderately obese is more important than over obese or under obese. And our topics is, particularly my topics, is what is the importance of this moderately or optimistically moderate, moderately fatty some individuals? and what they get advantages of the obesity. Even they are obese, but what advantages they are getting? This is the basic concept of the obesity paradox. Previously, we were students. We were, we know that the obesity people die earlier. Obesity people, they, they go to ICU very often for this heart attack. Obese patient, they go to hemodialysis unit for the dialysis, for CKD. But this concept has been a little bit changed with the new idea of the obesity paradox. What this means? That means 
So always obese patients should not die very earlier. And all obese patients should not go to ICU. That is, yet is there. So what do you mean by yet? So there is transition if we go a little bit to the history of this study. This slide is basically this American Journal of Kidney, this is 2005. You see, they have shown the time-dependent association between BMI and two years, all-cause bundle living 54,535 hemodialysis patients. They have shown, as we show, this relative risk of CV risk, the relative risk of all-cause mortality and all-cause death, they gradually decreases. And very notice to the point, if it is audible, uh, this will be fine. So this is, you see, this point is very important. This is the crucial point. Between 30 to 35, if we BMI touches, this is very golden point. If it is, so this is the golden point. This is the point again. This is the decrease gradual point. So this is very important point. If it goes towards the more BMI, you see the all-cause mortality comes down. So this is very, very important history. It's a very long, old slide, 2005. This shows there's some benefit of the obese patients if they gradually, well, they come to grow more obese than is underweight. So this again slides time-dependent association between the BMI and two years cardiovascular mortality in 54,535. You see, this relative cause of CV death is gradually decreases as we approach from higher obesity groups from 23 to 30, 35. So this is the basic contest. The scientists try to find out this, what are the basic reasons of this, and this is the concept of the paradox of obesity paradox. So this again very important slides. You see the again plotted. Hello, why? So this is the concept again. It comes if you see the interesting point or the cutting point or the green line and the red lines between 30 to 35 BMI index. This is a very golden important points. These have to come down so with 30, 35, they get greatest advantage from this. Even they are obese, they are getting the greatest advantage. So this is very important cutting points, 30, 35, the golden points. Gradually comes down, you see. Even they are obese, underweight, they gradually goes down and down. Even obese patient goes out to get the advantage. This is important point. Even they are obese, even they are 30, 35 BMI, that's class on obesity, they get advantage and they better survival this worse mortality. So this is the, again the very important slide that goes uh, for these concepts of the obesity paradox. This third slice is a basic obesity paradox is the J sub cat phenomena. That means if we go to the hazard issue of the 1.5 comes down, obesity goes, BMI goes up. This is the concept. This again 30, 35, this is important point. These patients are getting better probably better the outcomes and good outcomes at this point. So this curve definitely shows the advantage of this moderately obese patients getting advantage from the underweight people and even obese patients as far as all cut mortality and cardiovascular mortality is concerned. So I say in the pictorial presentation, these patients moderately obese, they're a little bit better protected from this, from the lean and thin papers. So the points the history goes, they said, what the definitions of obesity paradox is medial, medical identity, medical is the entity, which hold obesity may counter Intuitive to be protective and associated with greater survival in certain group of peoples. The obesity paradox may simply by reflect a lack of, basically lack of understanding of the complex pathophysiology of obesity and the association between adiposity and CV. It is a very complex subject abuse where my friend Shobito very clearly found the complex presentation of adiposity is a very complex subject. Types of fat, what types of fat they are secreting and what the different functions, still we do not know. So what the pathophysiology, so this mysterious subject is obesity is a very concerned subject. So this, in a large perspective, study, what is the evidence of the clinical studies? You see, the studies in coronary artery disease is by Grunenbarth and co-workers 10 years ago. They found in a large prospective study of involving for two to two last 50,000 patients with CVD followed for three to five, eight years, overweight and obese patients had lower mortality compared to the underweight and normal weight individuals. Similar findings were reported in a large cross-sectional cohort of based elevation and infarctions, STEMI patients, in STEMI survivors. So this is again very important concept of this point. This uh, definitely show this uh, slice of study to show the greater survivals of the CV part is concerned than obese patients from the underweight or even moderate obese patients. So then studies in heart failure, if you find studies support these findings with all 10%, you see lower mortality rate for every five unit increase in the BMI 
Similar results were found in younger hospitalized individuals with lower mortality in a near linear fashion as those with a higher BMI in spite of having a higher prevalence of type 2 DM. So this is the very old subject, DIG trials, that digital is measured in group trials, DIG trial, data from the 7767 OPD patient. The DIG study definitely showed the advantage of these patient obese patients as far as cardiovascular heart failure part is concerned. So then start with the type 2 diabetes patient even. You see the several studies have described a decreased mortality rate in obese individuals with type 2 diabetes. In a pooled analysis of five longitudinal cohort studies, results show that the participants who were normal, it experienced uh, uh, increased, uh, it experienced higher total and non-cardiovascular mortality rate compared to those which are overweight in obese patients. So this important enlarged muscle mass and the better monitor status comes in concept. So the obesity paradox may be partly explained by the lack of the discriminatory power of the BMI to differentiate between the lean body mass and the fat mass. Higher mortality in the low BMI categories may be due to the sarcopenic obesity that is characterized by low muscle mass. So the concept is low muscle mass is more important for the BMI. So the BMI concept has been changed. It should be a little bit definition to be changed. So BMI concept, it will come to be lean body mass and other components should be there rather than as a whole BMI. So this body composition is more important. You see, the lean body mass but not body fat were associated with favorable changes in the prognostic factors such as better hand grip strength. We can simply bedside test muscle mass by simple hand grip by the bedside. So by the bedside test, the hand grip test, you can jolly well judge what is muscle power. Other research has hypothesized that a decreased BMI could be a surrogate of the malnutrition inflammatory complex syndrome that may cause a worse prognosis in patients with chronic heart failure. So what is the new concept of this cachexian slow motions and malnutrition inflammatory complex syndrome, the non-nutritional inflammatory hypothesis, the undisnourished uh, peoples more likely to develop protein energy malnutrition and slow the recover, slow recovered illnesses from its complications. Increased release of IL-6 and TNF-alpha may suppress appetite, may cause muscle proteolysis and hypoalbuminemia, and may be involved in the process that leads to atherosclerosis. So patients with low albumin, low cholesterol and creatinine and homocysteine concentration might represent MICS, making them to prone to infection inflammation. So this is known as cachexia in slow motions. So they simply by say, this is undernourished people, why they're suffering from more heart failure than the overnourished patient. This is simply by this nutritional inflammatory hypothesis. So the TNF-alpha receptor in obesity concept. So TNF-alpha is elevated in chronic heart failure and in dialysis patient, we know that, and may contribute to cardiac injury through the pro-apoptotic and the negative anotropic effect. Adipose tissue produces soluble TNF-alpha receptors, which may play a cardioprotective role. So this is known as TNF-alpha hypothesis. Then neurohormonal alterations, the lean subjects had significantly higher increase in the plasma Adrenaline and renin concentration during treadmill testing despite similar baseline values and history of hypertension. So heightened sympathetic renin angiotensin activates associated with a poor prognosis in heart failure and fluid overload states such as those seen in dialysis patients. So this is known as neurohormonal hypothesis and endotoxins, lipoprotein hypothesis. There are so many hypotheses and reasons for behind the backup of the paradox. paradox. So lower serum of total cholesterols and lipoprotein concentrations are strongly and independently associated with impaired survival in dialysis patients. It replaces a richer pool of the internal lipoproteins that can actually bind to the and remove the circulating endotoxins, which effectively deters inflammation and subsequent atherosclerosis. So this is known as endotoxins lipoprotein hypothesis. Then endothelial progenitor cell. This is a very new concept. Severely obese patients. Despite higher levels of the C-reactive proteins and leptins may be partially protected from the atherosclerosis through a greater mobilization of endothelial progenitor cells. A reduction of the circulating bone marrow derived endothelial progenitor cells Durga, please has, been, con please conclude. Durga, please has con dropped as a novel mechanism of vascular disease. I'll take only two to three minutes. So thrombexin production hypothesis and ghrelin sensitivity hypothesis and you see the gut microbiota is comes to every part. So this is the law, lot of mechanisms why the obesity paradox occurs. So what manifests obesity paradox is heart failure, is a chronic heart disease, 
ischemic heart disease, severe stroke, peripheral vascular disease, post-operative complications following cardiac surgery, inhuman diabetes, all are manifested over the paradox. And investigation basically the BMI, body composition, by various methods, amplometry measurement, dual energy X ray absorptiometry, lean body mass by dual energy X ray absorption and lean body mass calculated, muscle strength by simply I have told bedside hand grip strength and this isometric dynamometry, cordyceps strength, isokinetic dynamometry. There are so many investigations and basically the very important is how to manage this obesity paradox peoples. So balanced ex physical exercise or weight loss is very important. Balanced physical activity, good metabolic control, the avoidance of smoking. Blood sugar testing is more important than your body mass compositions. The body of BMI. So periodical measurements of the muscle metabolic parameters, visceral fat by MRI or CT scan, muscle strength, etc. by proper anthropometric measurement. More important from a BMI, gradual BMI measurement. So BMI measurement, not a mere of your obesity paradigm, should be measured by the anthropometric measurement. More important. Then how to contribute? The obesity is associated with a higher overall mortality risk in the general population. This goes without saying. Yet, obesity confers a survival advantage in some clinical subpopulations. Several prospective studies have reported that JSF curve, we have described what the JSF relationship between the obesity and the mortality, suggesting high risks of death in lowest and the highest BMI groups. Obesity paradox may simply reflect our lack of understanding of the complex pathophysiology of obesity and associated between adiposity and severity. Obesity paradox exist as evidence from several epidemiological and prosperity it really exists obesity paradox. Metabolic parameters and proper anthropometric measurement are more important than your BMI measurement. Obesity paradox has been reported for various diseases including stroke, MI, heart failure, diabetic, CKD. Subpopulation of the obesity paradox is another important point issue. This particular BMI is 30 to 35 kg per meter squared. Elderly, it is found more in elderly populations, type 2 diabetes, CAD, and CKD patients. So adverse metabolic profile is so bad adiposity, metabolic syndrome, etc. Most important, both in obesity individuals and to increase BMI, normal BMI response. So that's why the adverse metabolic profiles is a bad prognosis rather than your good metabolic profile. So I just conclude with the thought that all the obese patients should not die earlier. So there is some population, subpopulation obese patient, rarely protected form out heavy rain by a good umbrella. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, D.P. Chakraborty, for your <coughs> excellent deliberation. Now I invite Professor Spandan Bhaduri. He will speak on optimizing statin therapy in Indian coronary artery disease. Spandan, please. Good evening. Uh, as on onset, I must thank the organizers for asking me to deliver on this topic to discuss something about statin in Indian setting. And uh, to cut it short, I go straight to the topic. Is a, as far as the burden in India is concerned, uh, as per data from ICMR in 2015, the uh, total CHD cases went into laxes, and out of total CV deaths, nearly 60% were due to deaths due to coronary heart disease. From Mendelian studies, randomization studies, of more than 3 lakh people, it is 6 different genes were seen which exposed to persons to long-term LDLC which resulted in more than 50% risk reduction of coronary artery disease per 38.7 milligram per DL, that is one mole millimole LDL concentration level as far as genetic uh, tuning of the person concerned. This is equivalent to threefold greater reduction of risk then that is observed with statin treatment. Hence, reduction of this long-term exposure of LDL and early initiation of statin is important in a CBD setting. From epidemiological studies, we have learned in a cohort of high black subjects and 18,000 ischemic events, estimated that 10% reduction of serum cholesterol lowered the ISD event by 50% at, at age of 40 which came down to 20% at the age of 70. So as, as age advances and the uh, cholesterol exposure is pretty long, the efficacy of drug treatment decreases. In a meta-analysis of 26 RCTs of statin, including almost 170,000 of subjects, showed that statin use was associated with 22% proportional risk reduction of mass 
per 1 millimol LDL reduction over 5 years period. With this the knowledge in background, we can conclude or think that we should hit early and hit strong to the problem of hyperlipidemia as far as ACVD event uh, reduction is concerned. Now some Indian data, these are uh, well-controlled RCTs done under the uh, uh, auspices of ICMR by different authorities which together has uh, shown that more or less in male, male and female the dyslipidemia percentage is at, at around 25 to 35 percent in different parts of the country. Now notable features of dyslipidemia in South Asian saw that CAD occurs early with relatively lower LDL cholesterol. At any level of LDL, they tend to have higher APOB concentration, high triglyceride and low HDL con concentration, increased level of small dense LDL particles. HDL particles tend to be small and dysfunctional, and we have genetic predisposition of higher LPA, LPA concentrations. This so-called atherogenic dyslipidemia may partially explain the increased coronary artery disease risk in our population. And another important issue is Indians respond well with lower doses of statin. From different meta-analysis, it is uh, very much clear that statin at commonly clinically used drugs cause at around 40 to 50 percent reduction of LDL level in blood. I am not going into details of this slide. Now, from all this data, the, our approach should be, as far as the prevention of future CV events are concerned, that we should think in the line of what works and in whom. A simple evidence-based approach to prevent cardiovascular disease. Enough of well-controlled, well-organized, randomized clinical trials suggest that statin therapy should be used as an adjunct to diet, exercise, and smoking cessation for secondary prevention in patients with past history of MI, stroke, or clinically apparent ACVD, as evidenced by 4S, HPS, care, and L lipid trials. So for secondary prevention, statin use is a must. For primary prevention, RCT support statin for persons with diabetes, as evidenced from CARS trial, elevated LDL cholesterol or West of Scotland coronary prevention study, low HDL concentration APSCAP study, elevated inflammatory markers Jupiter study justification for the use of statins in prevention and intervention trial evaluating statin, and multiple risk factors and together of patients belonging to intermediate risk hope three study that is heart outcome protection evaluation. All these studies done in primary prevention setup uh, shows that statin use is beneficial. High quality RCTs also suggest while prescribing statin, maximize the incentivity of treatment, focus efforts on compliance and long term adherence. And this thing based on proved trial, travastatin or atravastatin evaluation and infection therapy treat to new target therapy atravastatin and ideal incremental increase in clinical endpoints through aggressive lipid lowering strategies. These are the studies where atravastatin mostly was tried against simvastatin. The target dose for an individual patient is the highest tolerated and approved dose for the statin use. This is the bottom line. Now as far as ACS is concerned, intensive statin treatment reduces rates of recurrent MI ischemic deaths, repeat revascularization and stroke. Patients with higher baseline risk get higher benefits. And pre-procedural statin loading also provide incremental benefits. Atravastatin 80 mg or ozovastatin 40 mg to be initiated at the time of admission and continued after discharge. Now, this is a suggested CV risk assessment approach for Indian dyslipidemia. As all of us know that in American and Europeans have a lot of their score so a system, scoring system to assess their risk, which Indians do not have because we do not have enough data. And recently, cardiology, CSI has published a textbook of cardiology and Indians' perspective where this suggested CV risk assessment approach is being published and I am showing that, that if there is clinical feature suggestive of high risk like ACVT, DM, CKD, extreme of a single major factor, yes, then it is already high risk. If not, 
count the major risk factors. If the major risk factors are 0 to 1, it is a low risk person. If the major risk factors are 2 or more, then we can use the most appropriate WHO South East Asian chart for risk calculation. And if the total risk calculated is more than 20%, patient can be taken as high risk. And if the patient is belonged, belongs to the intermediate risk group, further risk assessment is required. Look for non-conventional risk like metabolic syndrome, obesity, CRP, the inflammatory markers, etc. Imaging for subclinical atherosclerosis at experience center who can do it nicely. And if multiple non-conventional risk factors are found and or evidence of subclinical atherosclerosis is found, then patient is to be stamped as high risk person. Now what about the Western guidelines? We are very fond of telling they say. Let, let, let's see what they say. We have three important international guidelines being published in the last two years. This is 2018 SECHA publication on management of cholesterol. This 2019 SECHA guideline for primary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And 2019 ESC guideline on diabetes, pre-diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And together they have uh, proposed these flowcharts like this which are very common but too complicated and busy for primary prevention and secondary prevention setup. But overall this does not differ from what the Indian proposition is. But one important uh, conceptual distinction is the very high risk population which is very overt in our clinical eye, that is pa patients we, who had major SCVT events like recent ACS, history of MI, history of stroke, symptomatic peripheral arterial disease, etc., they need require special attention and care. As far as diabetic subset is concerned, this uh, ESC 19 guideline has proposed that these three subcategories, very high risk, high risk and moderate risk, that is the diabetes with very high risk are who had this established CVD or target organ damage or major risk factors or early onset type 1 diabetes more than 20 years duration and moderate risk is type 1 less than 35 years or type 2 less than 50 years with DM duration less than 10, 10 years without other risk factors in between are this high risk group. And this same this uh, uh, ESC, ES guideline recently published, they have proposed that in secondary prevention setting, the patient at very high, high risk group, the LDL reduction should be more than 50% with a target less than 55. In primary prevention setup, set up, patient who are very high risk, LDL reduction at least more than 50% from baseline and goal less than 55. This is two important message that if the patient belongs to the very high risk group, whether in primary prevention setup or secondary prevention setup, the those reduction should be less than 55. Now, the some issues regarding, regarding statin induced adverse features, myalgia, myopathy, all of us are uh, very familiar with, but very uncommon. And this is how we differentiate if there is classical pattern, bilateral leg muscle group weakness, etc., onset after four to six weeks, and there are known risk factors of myopathy, then we should think of changing the drugs. And this is a GS Wonder study, Indian study, where they have uh, asked 400, 401 physicians their approach of dealing with statin intolerance, 40% reduced dose. 35% stopped statin and restarting at a lower dose and these are the common approaches. And statin and diabetes though there is a theoretical risk but practically the risk is very minimal. Meta-analysis of 13 RCT showed that treatment of 255 patients over 4 years resulted in one new diabetes and prevented 5.4 CV events. Spondon and these are the, uh, these are the potential know, drugs and lastly I I'd mention, okay. like to mention the take home messages. Indians suffer from a pattern of dyslipidemia which is more atherogenic. Indians do get ACVT events early by at least a decade. In contrast to people of developed world, Indians respond well with lower doses of approved statins. In absence of development of risk prediction tools which is specially designed for and tested in our population, the simplified approach proposed by CSI may be adopted and also tested in our population. Long-term exposure of LDL cholesterol is important, heat early and heat strong. 
the target dose for an individual patient is the highest tolerate is approved dose for the statin used. Thank you for your kind hearing. Thank you, Swandanda, for uh, your excellent speech. Uh, let's now invite uh, Dr. Hamid Ali for the last talk of the day, that is hypertriglyceridemia in Indians. Does it require treatment at all? Dr. Hamid Ali, please. What is the slide? Uh, respected chairperson, uh, it is my great privilege to talk in front of the August gathering on the most debated but worth spending topics, hypertriglyceridemia in Indians does it require treatments. So, <clears throat> My previous speaker already mentioned about the high dose statin. Yes, very important. High dose statin should be the first target of the uh, any dyslipidemia. I will quickly go through the prevalence of hypertriglyceridemia in India, the residual CV risk, and severe risk for patient on statin therapy, and the hypertriglyceridemia and its role in the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and whatever the guidelines are there. The prevalence of dyslipidemia in diabetics, if you consider the 85.5 percent of the males and 97.2 percent of the females are having a dyslipidemia. Now, if you throw the, go through the Indian Heart, Indian Heart Watch multi-site study, here you can see the LDL cholesterol more than 100 is near about 50 percent and TG more than 150 is almost 42 percent. It's not a very joke. Now, if you go through the 20-year trends in the Jaipur heart was study, is Indian, all of them talking about the Indians, the cholesterol levels are gradually decreasing because of the widespread use of the statin. No question about it. But on the contrary, we are seeing that triglyceride levels are gradually increasing over the 20-year trends in the India. So why the TG is getting importance? So why do we need another metric in the dyslipidemia management? Statin is there, LDL is there, why are we doing? We are considering the another lipid parameters. The most important is that the, this line, the risk of CAD remains high even after the achieving the recommended LDL goals as per our previous speaker, Professor Vaduri. Yes, we know the statin is the most important drug. Now, if you go through this slide, primary prevention, already mentioned about this, all the studies at best reduced the incident 25 to 30 percent. The remaining 70 percent of the risk is remain even after achieving the LDL cholesterol as per the recommended goal. So something is there. We have to think beyond of the statin. Now, if the R31 study, residual risk reduction in the diabetic studies, here you can see this, the, again, the risk reduction in DM is less with that of the statin. So something is there in the DM special is there. Now, if you consider the non-HDL, yes, you can see this kaplan meyer chart. If the non-HDL is gradually increasing and the risk of mortality or CBD bend, CBD bend incidence is increasing. So here is also non-HDL is also an important part. Now, non-HDL and CBD risk, if you go through this slide, now, if the targeted LDL cholesterol is more than 100, but non-HDL is less than 30, the hazard risk is almost 1, 1.02, peculiar things. Now, if the non-HDL is more than 130, that is not controlled, but LDL is controlled, then the hazard risk is 1.32 is higher, 30% higher. So that means among the statin treated patients, non-HDL is associated with a risk of future major CV events even when the LDL cholesterol is controlled. So role of non-HDL in the DM is also supported by the Framingham core study, Framingham Austin study, lipid research follow-up study, as well as the MR fit study. This shows that relative risk of death in the DM compared to the non-DM is 7.2 for LDL less than 100. Just look at the figure. But non-HDL is more than 130. So that's very important. Now, non-HDL is a better indicator of residual risk than the LDL-C and the APO-B. Where, when, which condition is very important. The condition is, is 
the TGR associated the 200 to 500. In this condition, non-HDL is more predictive of the cardiovascular disease than the other. And as well as the patients on the statin therapy, in that cases, the non-HDL is an another important marker. Now we can see, sir, as already the Bhaduri sir has mentioned about the increase or high intensity of the statin to reduce the LDL cholesterol, and this obviously will reduce that to some extent of the triglyceride also. But the Vajda study shows that the 50 percent not attain that targeted TG goal in spite of the optimal statin dose. So in spite of using highest dose of statin, you can see again that is 70 percent, 70 to 80 percent of the CV will still occur. This is very important. So this is and this is already mentioned about the studies. Now residual risk, cardiovascular risk for patients on the statin therapy. This is also the HPA study, RAL study, Arvida 2 style, YOLO trial all showed this showed that the higher event rate than in the non-DM even after the 40 milligram simvastatin in the RAL studies that is the marked progression of the atherosclerotic volume even after the 80 milligram out of statin in the DM and in the Arvida 2 progression of CMT in the DM even after the statin therapy. And the YOLO trial shows the lipid core content is still high even on the statin therapy. We know the every guidelines dictates about the LDL, LDL and LDL, but no one says about the TG. But they are giving the target TG should be less than 150. Why? There is no definite guideline. They are not telling that TG should be reduced by this way, by this way, by this drug, this drug. But what they are dictating that TG should be less than 150. So something is there that is not mentioned because these are all the studies are uh, uh, regarding the uh, TG is mainly the very uh, not a very large study. And the miracle studies also say that TG as the TG is increasing the risk of cardiovascular events is increasing. Even another study the Kajiko it also that the TG when the TG is more than 100 increase risk of the CVD and the not fasting TG is mainly related with the TG RL. Again, this is the Shankar et al. They showed that HTG is associated with the ISD, especially in the combination of the diabetes increase OST ratio and the obesity. In the large mental analysis, it also showed that one standard deviation increase in the TG level, there is a 54 percent increase in the risk of the MI. These genetic studies also proved that TG has a very good role in the pathogenesis of the atherosclerosis, a single nucleotide polymorphism study, mutation of the LPL gene, mutation of the APO-C3, angiopoietin like four protein, all studies show that the TG has a great role in the atherosclerosis. Now how they cause the atherosclerosis? The very large micro, large molecules cannot enter, but the TG remnants are freely enter into the uh, endocyte, uh, um, vascular cell, and they, they, uh, they are uh, basically degraded by the LPL and they produce the free fatty acid and the mon uh, monacyl glycerol as well as they also easily taken up by the macrophage and they form some foam cells and they also release some inflammatory markers and they actually produce the atherosclerosis. Now we know that LDL, we have about the small dense LDL is more atherogenic. This small dense LDL are usually associated with the TG. When the a fasting TG is more than uh, near about 100, there is 85 percent of the population has a predominantly large bone and LDL particles in comparison to the fasting TG more than 250, where the small dense LDL particles. So higher TG level is associated with the small dense LDL. Role of TG in atherosclerosis. Another study shows that increased TG levels, TG levels by 88 milligram per DL are remarkably raises the risk of CD, CAD by 30 percent in the men and 75 percent in the women. And then another is also the effect of lower TG on the, and the heart TG on the coronary atheroma scry. This is also published in the arterial thrombosis vascular biology. Here is that irrespective of the achieved LDL cholesterol, CRP level or in the diabetic status, uh, status of the leg, significantly increased atheroma volume in uh, atheroma volume regression with the lowering of the TG. Now the HTG and CVD is also another study is that non-fasting TG, non-fasting TG is also associated with the non-fasting TG less than 90 had a 60 percent lesser risk of CB events compared to the participant with the non-fasting TG more than 350. This is also supported by the BIPD style and Jupiter style also shows that role of TG RL in the pathogenesis. Field and accord, the low, large two trial on the phenophyll rate, they fails to give any benefits on the primary endpoints, but the most fallacy of this study is that they take the TG level near about 150 to 165 like this, not higher TG levels. But then the sub analysis showed that benefit in patients with the higher TG level, higher baseline TG level more than 200 and the low HDL level less than 40. 
So Indian Westerns, we already, I'm not going details. This is already mentioned. These are uh, Indians are very peculiar. Peculiar is the term of there are peculiar uh, uh, parameters. And the Asian Indian paradox is there. Asians are having a higher uh, cardiovascular events. And Asian having a higher atherogenic dyslipidemia. This is mainly the high TG, low HDL, and the high small dense LDL. And this is are more pre prevalent in the Indian type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and CSD, the young. And this is another important new onset type 2 diabetes is statin dependent patient, the atherogenic dyslipidemia has a role. Risk assessment tool to be India for the Indian to be uh, changes or multiplied. Usually the Framingham risk score is multiplied by 1.2 to 2 times. Lipid management in India is a national cross-sectional study also showed that for high TG, we are the physicians of the Indian physicians who use the statin fibrate combination mostly. Principal intervention of this TIG dyslipidemia, this is the point is more important, the unique pattern of the dyslipidemia in India to be kept in mind. So there should be individualized approach is important and this approach should be extended beyond the conventional stereotype guidelines. And non-HDL cholesterol may be particularly precious for the Asian Indians. And HDG and the low LDL cholesterol concomitantly raises the rate of CSD nearly twofold. And this is relevant in the treatment of dyslipidemia in Indians. Well, the non family treatment, yes, more important, the lifestyle measurement, lifestyle measurement, and lifestyle measurement, and exclude the secondary causes. What about the pharmacological therapy is there? Yes, statin is the most important when the TG is more than 200. And if the in the uh, armamentian, there's a fibre, fibrate is there, there are so many styrodols there. Sarogulitas are in the diabetic, dyslipidemia, and atherogenic, di atherogenic diabetic dyslipidemia. Statin fibrate combination, mainly the, it's, it's proved in beyond that TG less than 200 milligram DL is not achieved with statin, then the statin fibrate combination should be used. And the other important trial is that, that omega-3 fatty acids, equals of intern ethyl group, uh, ethyl 2 gram BD or 4 gram, this is a reduced it trial, is proved it, and strain trial also proved that omega-3 fatty acids are a very good drug. And as per the Indian guidelines, if the, they have given importance on the TG, but later on they give uh, importance on non-HDL cholesterol. So statin and niacin combination are not very good drugs. In summary, non-statin lipid lowering agent should not be considered again and again should not be considered without proper statin therapy. We do not have the strong evidence for massive reduction with the TG lowering therapy and this is mainly fruitful in the mainly in the TG lowering therapy is fruitful in the diabetes, atherogenic diabetic insulin minima uh, with a high CBD risk and established CBD. So the medicine is constantly changing and evolving we often have to deal with the moving targets. Clinicians should use their judgment, evidence, and experience in treating high TG in Indians on the background of uh, international guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid Ali, for your excellent deliberation. Now me and my co-chair, Dr. Rana Varchaj, express our sincere thanks to all the speakers. They have done the tremendous job in delivering their lectures. Thank you, and I conclude this session. Okay, uh, I uh, ask, request all the speakers to come on the dais to receive the mementos on behalf of the, our <coughs> scientific committee. First, Hamid,